So a lot of the themes that you're going to hear from me today and probably from Pierre later on um, is that this needs to be a holistic perspective when you're looking at how you're going to interact with your client base because at the end of the day just checking the box saying I bought an insurance policy doesn't work. If the claim or the loss has already happened, many of your clients won't recover. Uh, Hurricane's a great example. You could buy a ton of insurance, but if Hurricane Harvey blows through and shuts you down for three weeks or three months, there's no amount of insurance limit I can sell you that will bring you back to where you were before that event. So keep that in mind that insurance is, is a reactionary tool and oftentimes it's not really the cure. It'll help you limp back to life, but there's no guarantees. So just a couple things I wrote down from the last uh, session. I wrote down one, one quote I heard was, there is no perimeter, which I agree with. Uh, if there was a fence line, those, those boundaries have been broken down. And as a result, the vulnerabilities, which used to be front and center, are now coming from every angle, in some cases underneath the fence. Um, the, other, the other quote I wrote down was, embrace the cloud. Um, that comes both with and without uh, liability, which I'll get into. Um, one of the biggest fears I have for my client base that I work with, because I'm an insurance broker, is cloud dependency. And the reason is, is there aren't a lot of cloud providers out there. So before you get in bed with one, make sure you kick the tires and you carefully review how the liability transfers if something does go wrong. And we'll get into that in a minute. So to give you some background on me, and this is the only part of the infomercial you're going to hear, is we're one of the largest insurance brokers uh, in the United States. We place about $7 billion of written premium. Uh, embedded within that number will be cyber liability insurance that we also broker. And the important thing you need to think about is the information that you gather from your, uh, for your clients and, and, and that you implement uh, when putting together risk management controls and procedures, those things mean a lot to the underwriters that I talk to all day long. And for some reason, people don't want to share that data. Uh, and to me, that's a really important takeaway from today, is the work that you're doing has meaning, and it has a direct economic impact to the insurance companies that I broker policies with all day, and it also can result in better or worse terms and conditions. So the first part I, I mentioned that I'm going to discuss is how contractual liability uh, does attach to the work that you're doing as a security consultant. And there's any number of activities that you may be engaged in or hired to do. Um, you're, rep you're representing yourself from a legal perspective as an expert. You're charging a fee for that advice. When you do that, the bar raises as far as the standard of care and the expectations in the eyes of our legal system. So as a result, you become that easy target. So make sure when you're going through the different types of activities that you're offering, that you're, you're darn sure how you're disclaiming any areas where you may be somewhat deficient. Uh, there are areas where I'll step in and tell people, look, I'm not an attorney, but here's what I'm used to seeing in my world. Take it with a grain of salt, use it any way you want, scrub it with your own attorneys, but be careful in how you represent yourself to your client base. Some of these slides are sort of self-reading, so I'm gonna let you read them. You can read faster than I can talk. Uh, so we can stay on time. But there's going to be two types of liability that you're going to assume when you're working with your client base as a security consultant. The direct liability, that's the actual work that you're doing, but also the indirect liability that you create. And that's the big one I want you to take away from today. Your actions uh, will have a ripple effect into your client base. So if your client relies on your advice, and typically this is something that you're providing in writing, they could easily have problems later. As a result of those problems, you now have liability. And remember, just because that large client went down, let's say it's United Airlines, there's plenty of people that rely on United Airlines as well. So as that ripple goes through the pond, all of that liability is going to migrate its way back to your doorstep. So we'll, we'll, we'll get into the insurance later on, time permitting. But what I wanted you to see in this next slide is that there are plenty of ways uh, that you can transfer risk, and there's plenty of people that will push back and say, well, I'm doing everything possible. Why do I need to buy the insurance? Because I'm least likely to have the claim. 
I would tell you that nobody would have predicted that Equifax would get breached. Nobody would have predicted that the level of controls or the lack uh, thereof would ever be disclosed or discovered. And I think that snowball is going to keep rolling down the hill. And unfortunately, that's very much uh, probably a cultural issue here in the U.S. We react to things. We're not very proactive. We tend to take a, uh, a quick knee-jerk reaction. We assess blame and we move on. So what I would tell you is when you're looking at the question of do I really need insurance to protect myself, I would tell you yes. And the only thing you should be trying to decide is what levels, where should my insurance begin, and then also how much do I need. That's where you can sort of uh, put a fence around the actual insurance argument. So this one's pretty straightforward. This slide's basically telling you if something goes wrong with your client base, they will come back to you. Uh, I will say the one area of probably the most efficient area of uh, my day is dealing with the plaintiff's bar. Plaintiff's attorneys are extremely creative. They're driven by economics, and they go where the easiest uh, score is. And I will tell you that in the cyber world, that is the new gold mine for them. Uh, I remember sitting when I first started with Chubb uh, many years ago in a meeting like this, and Chubb was introducing the first employment practices liability policy. What EPL covers would be when, a, uh, when an employer is found uh, to be negligent in how they um, treat their employees, hiring, firing practices. So when you hear about sexual harassment and Bill O'Reilly on Fox News, et cetera, or uh, Harvey Weinstein, that's what these policies cover. So if you have a bad culture, if you, you have bad controls and procedures, uh, that's a good example of an EPL claim waiting to happen. When Chubb announced that they were coming out with that product, and I was only about a year, maybe two years in the industry, I looked to somebody who was sitting next to me and I said, they're gonna lose their shirt. And I was an employee of Chubb at the time. And Chubb was the first one that came out with very large employment practices liability towers, 50 million of limit, maybe 100 million. Now granted, they would spread that risk with other carriers, but the tower itself was in, in these big mega limits. And sure enough, Chubb lost a lot of money writing EPL. Uh, they had to revise how they underwrote the, the, the exposure, and they suddenly only began offering small limits, small bites. In other words, controlling their own risk. So they might insure Fox News, but when they did it, they're only putting up $5 million of limit, not $25 million. Talked a little bit about some of the larger uh, breaches in the last session. The reason I put this slide up is more to talk about the frequency and what we're seeing in some of the trends, if you look at the top five events, they've all happened in the last year, year and a half, and that's surprising. So if you come down the page, other than Heartland Payment Systems, which is a pretty well-known breach back in 09, everything's been happening in 16 and 17, which I think is, it's, it should be enough to get our attention. Also look at the sheer volume of records with Yahoo. While the records were significant, the amount of valuable data hiding in that, those records was not nearly as significant as what Equifax has, obviously. So for those of us in the room that were harmed by Equifax, do the math. U.S. populations probably, let's call it 325 million, 143 million records at Equifax were hit. And in those records, they've got more than just your email and your name. They've got date of birth, your mother's maiden name, probably your driver's license number, your SOCH, it just goes on and on. So one of the things we look at when we talk to our underwriters is not only the number of data records or data files, but what type of quality information is hiding in those files that would have value to those bad people and obviously would be most harmful to you. So Equifax, I think, is a real interesting case study in my world, which is probably for another session. But my team brokers a lot of coverage beyond just cyber liability. We would handle employment practices. We would handle directors and officers liability, kidnap, ransom, and extortion, fiduciary liability. The fiduciary coverage would uh, provide protection when your pension plan or your 401k plan uh, is not handled properly by the plan sponsor. So Equifax, for example, is gonna get sued at the DNO level. The directors and officers have liability for their poor actions in protecting the Equifax system and the digital assets that were in their control. The next. And the next claim we're going to see is probably an SEC-related action for 
insider trading that you've read about where there's a uh, CFO, um, obviously uh, dumped a bunch of shares with knowledge of the hack, hadn't been disclosed yet, and then we'll probably see more actions or follow-on type claims involving their own pension and or 401k plan. If there's company stock as investments in those plans, you as an employee of Equifax, since you participated in the 401k plan, have been damaged. Why? The value of your 401k assets went from here down to here overnight if 25% of those investments are in Equifax stock. So you can see how it's all interrelated. We have one breach, one hack, and in my world we have multiple touch points or multiple policies that are all triggering and responding, at least you hope. And one of the things we're really nervous about with Equifax is whether or not uh, the policy will trigger correctly because the, the specific clients of Equifax are not you and me. They're the, the financial institutions themselves. So while we're harmed, we're not a direct customer of Equifax. And depending on how their policy is worded, that may or may not trigger coverage. In other words, specific customers of Equifax, if they're damaged or harmed, yes, you'll trigger, you'll trigger the policy. But if you and I decide to file a class action, probably no coverage. So a lot of it's gonna depend on how good their broker wrote that policy. This is always a slide I put up for all of our uh, speeches when we get up and talk publicly, because everyone's interested in what specific areas are getting hit hard, and it continues to change. Um, there's trends that we see, and remember, everything I do is reactionary. And the hard part is, I can talk to you about trends from a year or two ago, because our loss data can't keep up with the pace of change, especially in the digital environment. So uh, we're not smart enough to know, uh, such as from an IT security perspective, how that bad actor or that hacker is gonna attack our system tomorrow. We can only typically uh, react to what's already been uh, done to us in our systems. But I think some of, these, some of these industries will always be targets. I think anything in the uh, professional services area, healthcare, financial services, those seem to be hot ones. Entertainment was another weird one that seems to draw a lot of attention. And uh, a lot of it has to do with the motivating factors of what's going to bring that hacker to your doorstep or to your client's doorstep. It, they're not always motivated by money. So I think it's important that you try and understand when you're mapping out how you're gonna provide the right insurance protection, how it blends or meshes back into the culture or the environment that you've created within your client's company that you're trying to protect. In other words, at the end of the day, we should be able to at least try and look at the three to five significant or, or greatest threats that exist. And once we can agree on those, then map a plan on how to try and protect against it. But it needs to start up at the board level so that you have everyone's buy-in and, and uh, you're not gonna get very far if just having a, having a conversation with the IT folks. So again, I'm gonna let all of you kind of scan this, these slides quickly rather than me have, uh, go through reading them. Uh, there's some interesting trends though hiding in some of these uh, data points. Um, we've seen lost business costs actually decline. That's why I use the 2012 to 2013 numbers. And uh, I think what we're finding is the U.S. public, and I, I can't speak for people outside the U.S., but we're becoming more forgiving and when it comes to data breaches and probably less reactionary. In the, originally, there was, a, there was a panic. I think it's becoming more and more common. So I, I live in Chicago, so I can tell you that there's a lot of gang violence and all types of shootings every weekend. It never gets press, yet there's still a lot of people getting shot every day. So after a while, you become immune to it doesn't make it right, it just makes it reality. One of the, one of the items I'd look at is number six at the, at the bottom as well, where we talk about data forensics, the coverage that we can broker and put in place. We can cover a lot of what I'd call the first party protections, uh, such as notification, investigative uh, costs, audit services, crisis management, which would be a PR firm. Those costs um, have decreased as well. Um, and I think some of that uh, it does go up and down depending on the jurisdiction where you're located and the level of regulation behind those state laws requiring what you must do when you're found to be liable or responsible for a breach. This is actually an old slide. 
And the reason I know it's old is that the last line talks about extortion being rare. When I built this slide five years ago, extortion was unheard of. We never saw cyber extortion. Now we see it all the time. It's a frequency event, which I think is very interesting. Uh, in the past, we had a lot of clients that chose not to purchase cyber extortion. They didn't think there was a risk or that they didn't think they were a target. What we're finding now is it becomes uh, more of a, a rampant event where someone's seeking 10 to 100 grand each time once they encrypt your data so you can't acquire that encryption key uh, to get your data back. Um, so what we're, what we're noticing in today's world is that is a whole new cottage industry for a, a certain group of hackers that are out there. I think it's also important to note that you can have security breaches that have nothing to do with your IT system but eventually turn into an IT problem. So it gets back to that comment about there really is no perimeter anymore. Uh, Dr. White mentioned if someone can get in the building, they can get into your computer system. And there's a theme that I would keep bringing you back here is we're, we're talking about cyber liability, but it jumps over the fence throughout all of these sessions when we want to talk about how do we protect your client base and your, your business itself. There's a, there should be a holistic approach to how you view risk and how you attack uh, protecting that risk. Cyber just happens to be one of uh, the areas, but it's not the sole area. What we found with the uh, legal landscape is that the plaintiff's bar has spent a lot of time and energy trying to develop their own, think of it as a cottage industry when it comes to privacy breaches and cyber liability. Um, a lot of states um, didn't even have privacy laws until most recently, and the U.S. government is still trying to catch up with it. Uh, Basically, at the end of the day, we live and, and, and breathe in a, in a culture where everything is reactionary. It's always after the fact. And our laws and our legal system uh, seem to drive a lot of the behavior uh, that most of us are trying to uh, uh, guard against. So as a result, you'll see situations where um, after a breach, they'll try and dissect what happened and they'll go through those steps and the plaintiff's bar is quick to begin pointing fingers and assessing blame. That seems to be sort of our, uh, if you're looking at a division of labor and a sequence of events, that seems to occur again and again. And I believe it's part of our culture here in the U.S. We're not very proactive, we're more reactive. And in the IT world, that's a really dangerous mix. So I'm kind of shifting gears here, starting with this slide. These are the things that if I were you and I were an IT security consultant, these were the things I would be uh, focusing on to try and mitigate and limit my own personal liability from my company as well as how that hits me as an individual. Because remember, if the attorneys show up and serve uh, suit papers at your door, uh, there's a bunch of ways they can um, um, hit you hard. Even if you've set up an LLC, for example, that doesn't necessarily protect you and stop them from going after your personal assets. So what I would do whenever you're setting up your contracts is just know that your larger clients, they're gonna hold the upper hand and most of those contracts are gonna be very one-sided. As a result, the language that's hiding in there deflects and pushes all the liability back to you. You wanna at least try and uh, build somewhat of a trench or a, a, a moat that will keep some of that liability away from you. You shouldn't have to accept all of it. Um, did everybody hear that okay? No. Um, the question was limits. How much limit should I buy, I think, was what you're asking. And If it's uh, the, the lawyers are going to want to clean you out. The client, the client, if he has a contract that says you need $3 million, then all you need to do is comply with that contractual obligation. 
Uh, normally what we find though is if you're doing business with larger firms, what they're going to try and do is tell you to buy 10 million or 20 million. So you can buy it, it's just very expensive. That's where you want to push back. Now, that's a good point. Yeah, the, 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 the comment was unlimited indemnification. So while the contract may state only three million of limit is a requirement, it'll also have another phrase or clause right after that that says, and you will indemnify me uh, with no boundaries. And so it's unlimited. So what you should be doing is limiting the indemnification agreement to the policy limit that you're carrying. You never want to offer more because now that's coming out of your your LLC, your corporation, or your individual pocket. Uh, but we see a lot of push from the big boys. Uh, if you're working with Microsoft, those are great examples where you can't go to them if your whole business is only three million in revenue and have them attach 10 million or unlimited liability to you. Um, the, the question was, uh, can we limit uh, the exposure uh, to only be those areas that you're actually touching, so to speak? Uh, and yes, you can, and that's actually one of my slides. <laughs> Bring in your attorney, have him review it, and I believe that's the first one right here. You can't be held accountable for any type of input or activity that unrelated third parties deliver to that same common customer. That's not fair. So if Cisco Systems is, is providing some level of expertise, they can't sue you because Cisco's uh, consulting or software failed to uh, trigger. You, you should, with your attorney, you should be able to wall that off. And, and I, don't, I think the only thing you would incur in that discussion after a claim would be the defense costs for a dismissal. Yeah, I'd agree. I, I mean, the cyber liability is something you should be um, pushing hard, and if they choose not to buy it, just get a disclaimer, have them sign off. Look, I, I accept the fact that XYZ Consulting told me I need cybersecurity. Uh, this is an area of uh, exposure to my company, and I'm not going to hold you responsible if I don't buy it. Um, the question was, will you have liability if a camera is installed, yet the uh, installing firm fails to put it through to your specifications? Unfortunately... I think it, it's a very, it's going to depend on the venue and how friendly the, the courts are in, in adjudicating that. So you have to put it in writing and you have to deflect the liability at the time the contract's put in place. So I would say without it in writing, you've left yourself open.
No, I'd agree with that. So you, you have a privacy exposure based on protecting the data, in this case the video, uh, and who happened to be on the video, Michael Jackson. Um, we work uh, with uh, different uh, companies that sell products over the internet. One of the reasons people like to buy products over the internet is it's somewhat protective. Uh, people don't know you're buying whatever it is that you're buying. Uh, we had a company in Cincinnati that sold uh, uh, sex toys and their primary uh, um, customer were women. So obviously they don't want to go into shops and buy this stuff, but they will buy it through the internet. Great example of privacy liability. If that information gets out, it could be very damaging. Uh, no different than the uh, uh, website up in Canada where you had, that was designed for married people that wanted to cheat on their spouses, same thing. So the protecting the information is extremely important depending on the type of client that you have. And uh, healthcare has very, very high standards uh, of legal liability if that somehow gets leaked out to the press, the paparazzi love it. So once it's out, you can't get it back. Yeah, we're going to get into that. There's a slide, so you guys are you guys are doing a good job. You're keeping me rolling. Uh, signed releases, I think, uh, speak for themselves. You definitely want an attorney to develop signed releases whenever you can. Again, you want to have a beginning and an end point to the work of the project that you're doing. If you don't do that, then it's going to leak into other areas that you never intended to provide expertise on. So you want to have that signed release that will clearly identify where you begin and where you end your project. This is another area that people just don't realize exists. Just because Microsoft tells you you need to go buy 20 million a limit doesn't mean you have to go get it. Uh, you can push back. That's where you should be working, not with your attorney, but with your insurance broker. I can tell you with a fair, uh, fairly high level of certainty what people of your size in your business typically have to purchase because I have other clients that look just like you that work with the big boys. So we have a pretty good idea of where and when you can push back and what is acceptable. You don't want to lose your largest client or customer over something as trivial as a limit of insurance, but at the same time, you shouldn't be forced to spend 30% uh, of your contract revenue or value on an insurance policy. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. Yeah, and, and most contractors do that. They're going to bake that cost right into the contract at the beginning of the engagement so that everybody knows how it's going to be paid for. Correct. So the question was, is there a downside that once you buy that higher limit, now you have to carry that limit for the duration of the policy period. You can't just drop it. That's true, and the reason is the underwriters have to charge you for that higher limit of coverage. Um, you're buying an aggregate limit in a 12-month period of time. That's your policy period. So whether you have one claim or 100 claims, that's the limit that the carrier is prepared to pay out if you were to have uh, a loss. So they can't sell it to you on a project-specific basis, which is what I think you're asking. Um, the beauty of that, though, is if you can bake it into that first client or customer contract, now that limit is paid for for the duration of the next 11 to 12 months, and you have that protection. But we do see certain firms gyrate their limits up and down based on how their uh, client base changes from one year to the next. So as those clients with higher uh, contract demands and limits uh, come out, then you buy more. Good point. I mean, I've got a, I've got a slide on that coming up. <laughs> You'll see that, and it's three, three more slides. So what they'll do is it's called a survivability clause. They're worried that liability, that breach won't be found for another 36 months or whatever. So you're required to continue and carry that limit of coverage for the next several years. Um, those survivability clauses will be more dependent upon the scope and the sensitivity of the work that you're performing. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. 
So we call that an extended reporting period. In other words, we want to know that if something wrong gets discovered several years from now, you still have insurance that will actually trigger. These policies are claims made and reported, which means you have to make the claim in the policy term. So if you don't buy that limit out into that third year beyond your contract expiration, I can't trigger that limit anymore. So if you had 10 million at the time of contract work, now you drop it back down to a one mil limit, you try and file that claim three years from now, I only have a one mil limit to trigger, even though the wrongful event took place years prior. So I've got a few slides in here to help you try and add more value when you're working with these customers so they don't just view what you're doing as an added expense in their world. And to me, this is an important part that you want to take uh, note of because you have the ability not only to help protect them and prevent them from having problems or losses, you have a way to help save them money and make them more efficient when they're buying their own insurance coverage. So a lot of the work that you're performing has value to my underwriters. And the problem is, is that information is never making it uh, to the insurance carriers. So all I want to do is make sure you're taking credit for the work that you're doing. And typically the way our applications are built is they're very long and painful. Uh, and it's mostly yes, no questions. There's no room for a narrative that says, this is the scope of our engagement with this security firm. This is what we're doing over the next three years. This is what the IT spend and budgetary concerns look like. And we have the board's uh, blessing and approval to get this done. That has a lot of power when I sit down with my underwriters. Uh, the best analogy I can give you is we worked with um, a large convenience store chain right after the target breach and they did not buy any cyber liability and their board said we want a hundred million of limit and uh, so I got on a plane flew out and sat down with them and I said I need to know what your controls and procedures are in the IT world before I can just sell you this policy and uh, uh, the board said we don't care I don't want to be the next target and I said well you're talking to the wrong guy you need to talk to some an IT security expert I'm not the guy that prevents the claim I'm the guy that writes the check after the claim there's a big difference and I said, if people don't feel secure swiping their debit card at the point of sale, they're going to walk across the street and they're going to go to Kmart or somewhere else and they're just not going to come back. So it goes back to my earlier comments about insurance. I'm reacting to the claim after it's happened. You need someone like Pierre in the middle bringing all these pieces together. Now we have a discussion that I can bring to an underwriter that's meaningful. But for me to sell a $100 million limit of cyber liability to a company that has no encryption software, any protections, and they have a pharmacy operation, they have a uh, frequent buyer club where they track all your buying patterns. I mean, there's a lot of sensitive data that they have that could be damaging. So what you're going to find is you need to start at the beginning with what, what are the key exposures that this client has? How do we mitigate those exposures? Insurance is not the box that you should be checking. It's one of the boxes, and it's certainly not the first one. The first step needs to be identifying what those exposures are. Then the next step needs to be putting an action plan in place, and insurance is one of those. So in this example, we did not put insurance in place for three years, and I had to talk the board into doing it. I said, I can sell you a policy, but here's what's going to happen. It's like me brokering and selling an automobile policy with an auto exclusion. They'll take your money, but they'll never pay your claim. because. They're going, to put an, they're going to put an unencrypted uh, device, or rather an, a, an unencrypted laptop exclusion. And I'm trying to think, when we got them quotes, their first $10 million a limit was going to cost them about $3 million. And I said, why would you spend $3 million on a policy that's not going to trigger? And at the end of the day, we could take that same $3 million bucks and start working on encrypting your data. So it was a very easy conversation, but the board felt compelled that they had to go through these steps. So it goes back to that check the box mentality, you have to be careful. Some of these things we've already talked about, when we can, when we can provide that roadmap of what you're doing for your clients, we're going to have these results for your clients. So instead of you delivering a bill for your work, hopefully you're going to help save them some money.
that's a good question. So I think the question you're asking is, rather than put through the expensive controls and procedures, I'll just buy insurance. <laughs> um, I will tell you that um, the clients that take that approach, we tend to avoid. There are some underwriters that'll sell you a low limit of coverage, maybe a million. Uh, again, it's gonna be chock full of exclusions. And what I often tell people is, if you're gonna spend $20,000 on an insurance policy and you're too cheap to put in the right firewalls, controls, and procedures, at least take the 20 grand. Don't give it to the insurance company. Give it to your IT department and do something useful with it. But throwing it into an insurance policy that's never gonna work, you're gonna have to sue your carrier to get them to pay the claim. It's, the question is what level of understanding or um, sophistication is the uh, insurance industry today when it comes to uh, putting their terms and conditions in place on a policy? The answer is uh, it's, very, it's a broad, broad spectrum. Um, most of the good carriers know it comes out of the application. So when you're filling out that lengthy application, you're at a point where they're asking questions about do you regularly install software patches, et cetera, when it's recommended by the uh, manufacturer. That application is a warranty and it attaches to the policy every year. So if you tell people that you're regularly installing patches and you don't, and then you have a claim, you have breached the terms and conditions of the policy. The underwriter has uh, the right to rescind, which is basically rip up the contract as if it had never been written and hand you the premium back, even though you're sitting on a claim. It's a good way to close it because I've got a lot more insurance slides and you'll fall asleep. <laughs> Thank you.